Welcome to the Arcade and Part 5 Assembly Prep. Welcome back everyone. So this is the slot cutter. So this is what we're going to be using to cut our groove for our T-molding. That's going to go around the edges of the cabinets. So this is a, a white side cutter. It has two parts to it. It has an arbor, which is the main shaft with the roller bearing on it. And it has the uh, three edge cutter on it. The cutters are interchangeable, so you can cut them at different thicknesses depending on your T-molding. Um, the thing you have to watch out is you have to make sure that the cutter thickness matches the T-molding you want to be using for your project. So the next step is to adjust the router uh, height so that you're actually cutting your slot in the middle of your wood. Uh, to do this, I usually wind up using a piece of sample wood. In this case, because we're using melamine, the wood is uniform in thickness, which makes things nice and easy. Uh, the concern is if you're using plywood, um, depending on where you buy your plywood, you might wind up having a variable thickness of the wood and you may want to measure and cut in multiple places depending on what's going on. Um, so in this case, I wind up measuring out where I think the router or where the cutter bit should go first and uh, make my first cut. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll apply a little bit of T-molding and see how it fits and how the edges line up. For this, you can pretty much use any scrap T-molding that you have lying around. Um, I do like to try and use nice T-molding um, just to make sure that it's uh, the right thickness for what's going on. But pretty much just as, well, line up your T-molding, pound it in with it, and then you can either take a, an edge and rub it, rub it uh, across the wood surface or your finger and figure out where, how much overlap you have. Um, it seems like every time I measure it, no matter how close I am, I always have to wind, wind up going back to the router and making height adjustments, which is fine. This is why we're doing it here as opposed to on your actual cabinet. So now you go back to your router, make your adjustments on it for your height, make sure you adjust it the correct way, which I've commonly done the wrong way as well, and you wind up making your second cut. Um, in this case, I got lucky in that I only had to make one adjustment for it to get everything to line up correctly. Uh, if this is your first time doing this, don't feel bad if you have to adjust it half a dozen times. Uh, it gets easier with practice, but um, getting that perfect edge is, is sometimes difficult to do. And as I said, it's easier with the uh, melamine because of the thickness is uniform with it. Um, but to try and work for that perfect edge as best you can. T-molding is one of those things that drives me absolutely nuts when it's a little bit off. All right, with the router finally set up, we're now ready to start actually doing some cutting for our cabinet. My personal preference is usually try and cut outside if I can with it. Um, if you're going to be cutting inside, make sure you have you're wearing a respirator, good ventilation, all of those good things. Nast, nasty chemicals in the dust. So when you're cutting with it, when you're using your router, uh, the router has, when you're looking down from above, winds up spinning clockwise. And so as the blade spins, it's doing its cutting with it. And what you do want to do is when you're cutting with your router is you always want to be pushing into the wood, meaning pushing towards the cut so that uh, the blade as it spins is hitting into the new fresh wood as opposed to spinning against the backside. Um, what happens is, is if you're cutting, uh, in this case, um, counterclockwise as I go around the outside here, uh, the router is pushing against the wood and I wind up having a nice, clean, good, even cut on it. If I'm cutting the other way, the router tends to run away from you and that's where you're going to get yourself hurt. Uh, so as you saw when I first started cutting, what I wound up doing was um, putting the router into the material. I did back off a little bit um, clockwise um, to get the edge, and that was mainly just to have a nice clean edge as I came into the material. And then I'm always going to be cutting, in this case, counterclockwise or against the material as I go around with it. Um, router height is set, which makes things easy and pretty much just take your time, go ever so slowly with it, and run the router bit around the, around the edge for you. The roller bearing is really what does all of the magic for you and makes it sure that you have a nice, even cut and you don't run, run, run into any problems. For my order of operations, usually I like to actually do this T-molding cut first. Uh, the reason for it is, is the melamine chips really, really easily. 
And most of the time I actually have some scrap T-molding lying around that I'd be doing an install on as soon as the cut is done. Um, what I've found in the past is if I don't cut it first, uh, as I move the panel around in the garage to make space for the next set of stuff that I'm cutting or working on, I'll set it down and it'll chip on the edge and the chipping will drive me absolutely insane. The other advantage of installing the T-molding first for me is that in this case, as I said earlier, I'm going to be installing this with Craig screws um, as opposed to using staples, which is usually the practice that most of the cabinet builders are doing. Um, the staples, people wind up using hardwood for blocking and glue the blocking in, hopefully, and then apply staples. Uh, some people just put staples in with it as well. Um, personally, I like to use um, Craig screws uh, for assembly. The issue is, is that the Craig screws all go into the panels at an angle, and depending on where your edges are, there is a chance that the Craig screws may actually uh, cross paths with the slot for your T molding. Um, so I'd much rather uh, cut the slot for the T-molding first, install the T-molding, and then put the Craig screws in afterwards. And if they go through the uh, barb on the T-molding, it doesn't really make much of a difference for me. All right, now it's time to actually start making some blocking for it. So there's two different scenarios for how you do blocking with it. Uh, as I said, in this case, I'm going to be using Craig screws. Um, you can also use uh, staples, um, wood staples. And uh, based on how you're going to do it, it's going to determine what material you're going to use. So in uh, a lot of the original cabinets were all put together using um, hardwood blocking, and then that was stapled in place, um, hopefully glued as well, but um, also glued and stapled with it. Uh, personally, uh, it works fine to use that. Um, what I found is that I have more issues with the melamine. Uh, as far as if it blows through the sides of the material afterwards, so meaning that I need to get the pressure exactly right uh, on my pneumatic nailer uh, to get the staples to sink into the material correctly with it. Since I'm not in a hurry, I'm going to be using Craig screws this time with it. The Craig screws, usually what I wind up doing is I use one by three pine blocking, um, and this is basically what I'm cutting here with it. Um, pine obviously is not a good choice if you're going to be using staples because it's soft, uh, but for the Craig screws it works out just fine. So here I'm measuring the edges of the uh, where the panels will be assembled with it. And we talked earlier about the dado cuts when we were cutting the uh, panels on CNC. So specifically like the, the front panel with it had the dado cut on it and basically it's going to slide into the, the dado slot on the side panel here. The dado as it goes in, um, the thickest part or the widest part of the material is always towards the center of the cabinet. So the surface that you cut out earlier is going to be facing towards the front of the cabinet. Um, so as a result of this, as I'm measuring for blocking, I'm going to always measure with the intent that the blocking is going to be on the inner edge of where the dado goes. And this way, when I put my Craig screws in, even if I have a little bit of extra play, the Craig screws are going to pull that front panel back towards the blocking so that I have that nice alignment and that nice firm connection that I want to have. Other things to think of when you're doing your blocking is how you're going to actually be putting your screws or doing your assembly on it. So if you look in this case, the front panel, um, when I cut the Craig screws in it, is going to be up a little bit higher, which is fine. Um, but the bottom panel with it, I'm going to have that basically, or I'll be putting screws in from the bottom up as well as from the top down. And so I want to have that try and run as much as I can. For this back section here, um, I want to basically have as large a piece as I can. So instead of running the base piece all the way across, I'm going to bring it up a little bit short so I can try and put a piece of blocking in the back there for the, for the, uh, the bottom base of the cabinet as well. You'll see as I'm going around adding the blocking with it, I'm always cutting everything in pairs. Um, this basically makes it just easier because I'll be doing two sets of, of this for obviously the two sides of the cabinets. The thing you have to remember is that if you're going to do any type of fancy special blocking cutouts, things along those lines with it, is that they are mirror images to each other to the two sides of the cabinets. Um, what I find is most of the time I just try and set up so that uh, when I start pre-drilling for the Craig screws that I'm going to be doing equal measurements from both edges. So it doesn't really matter if I have it oriented left to right or right to left. Um, the, mirror, the mirror image won't make any difference for me.
and I'm just kind of doing my last couple of measurements here, figuring out how I want to have the blocking layout. Where this is going to be challenging is, is the once you start to assemble the cabinet, you're not going to necessarily have space to be able to put the crank screws in. Um, and so the question is, is do you want to have the more sturdy support basically for the speaker panel or the more sturdy support for the top of the cabinet and then try and force the speaker panel in. Um, what I find is most of the time because the speaker panel is fixed on both ends, I, it's more difficult to slide in. So usually I want to have that as my more sturdy um, blocking essentially. And then the top panel, because it's cut all the way to the edge of the cabinet, I can actually slide that in from the end. Um, I will be gluing all of these as well with it, and I will still have some blocking in place uh, to put crank screws in. So I'm not too concerned about the top as a whole, but in this situation, like I said, the speaker panel is the bigger concern, so I'm going to put the heavier duty blocking at the speaker panel, and the top I can slide in after the fact. And now it's just time to finish off the blocking for the last couple pieces on the top here. The speaker panel, the marquee on the front of the speaker panel, is held in by a piece of metal. And then this goes into a slot that's cut in and onto the roof of the cabinet. So you want to make sure that your blocking is not going to interfere with the installation of the marquee. Um, still also need to cut blocking for the back of the cabinet, um, really to hold on that top back piece and secure that to the rest of the cabinet. With the rough layout of the blocking completed now, we can now start getting organized for cutting our Craig screws next. Alright, so the next thing I'm talking about here is Craig screws. Um, Craig screws is how I like to assemble these things, and this is the jig that you wind up using. So this consists of a jig, and then you have a, a bit. And what you'll note with the bit is that it goes thicker here and then it has a point at the end for it. So what you wind up doing is you set this up for the sizes that you need. So in this case, setting up for just shy of three quarter inch material for it. And we are also setting up at the top for three quarter inch as well. And so the idea is as this goes through and cuts, come through and I'll cut your pocket, but you'll still see that there's a little bit of a gap here of material left so it doesn't wind up blowing all the way through for you. Okay. So what I should have clarified here is with the Craig screws when you're doing it, you wind up setting a depth for your bit and a depth for the jig essentially. And what happens is, is these depths vary based on the thickness of the material that you're cutting. Uh, in this example, both sides are three quarter inch, which is wonderful, it makes things very easy. But um, you can vary your cut depths if you're trying to join half inch material to one inch material or three quarter inch material to one inch material or vice versa. So that's why you have different adjustments on the jig itself. We're now getting ready to start cutting our holes using the Craig jig. These holes, um, while the height is extremely important, the actual spacing left to right doesn't matter as much with it. Um, what I usually find myself doing is I'll line it up to the edge of the jig um, and this way I can have pretty uniform spacing as I go from side to side. So uh, basically you just wind up uh, drilling until your, your um, stop essentially at the top of the uh, drill bit uh, comes in contact with the jig and you wind up having a nice um, slot essentially where you can put your screw in uh, to attach, attach the pieces. Um, it should also be noted that you do have to use special screws when you're doing this and the screws vary in length. Um, so you have to be careful that, uh, especially if you have multiple different setups, that you're using the correct screws for the type of jig setup that you have with it. Um, in this case, the screws are set up specifically for joining 3 quarter inch material to 3 quarter inch material. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is as you're using these screws, you have to make sure that your thickness of your materials is correct. Um, so in this case, we're using 1 inch by 3 inch blocking. 
Uh, the one inch by three inch blocking basically trims down to just slightly over three quarters of an inch. So in this reality, I'm joining three quarter inch material to three quarter inch material. Um, you can also use your Craig, grew, Craig screws for uh, surface screwing the material together as well, which is also fine. Um, the concern that you're going to have to have is if you're dealing with something where you cut a, a dado type pocket or a pocket for alignment of it, is that uh, that tenth of an inch that you may have cut into the material and the thickness of the material that you're using may be just enough that the screw will now blow through your material on the far side with it. So you have to be very careful with the uh, drilling and uh, use of your screws. Um, it's also uh, noteworthy that uh, the pine being a softer material uh, does tend to compress very easily when you have a screw, so meaning that you can over screw a material past the surface of the pine. Um, so make sure that you're setting your clutch on your drill correctly so that it does stop once you hit the surface of the pine as well. Time to speed things up a bit and actually get through this process. I wish it was this quick and easy to actually do in time, but honestly the Craig Screws makes it pretty easy. Once you get your jig set correctly and your bit set correctly, everything just aligns nicely for you. So once you have all of your cuts made, it's now time to actually sand your wood. All right, it's now time to start prepping for paint. And you're sitting there saying, why the heck am I going to paint this? It's already finished in black melamine. Um, so what I like to do with this, and this is a me thing, I usually only wind up doing this for the cabinets I'm keeping for myself, is I'll actually wind up uh, spray painting all the edges of the cabinet black. Um, this partly is because of my anal retentive nature with the T-molding, but um, it also seals over the material. So as you saw in one of the previous videos, the melamine came in at like 0.772 inches thick with it. It truly is three quarters of an inch thick at 0.75, but as it gets exposed to air over time, it absorbs moisture and gets a little bit wider. So by doing this, I'm trying to keep the material as a uniform thickness. The paint basically seals over the um, raw surfaces and doesn't allow the air to penetrate into the wood so that the water doesn't get absorbed, allowing the wood to expand. Um, I think part of my uh, reason for this concern is much more that uh, I tended to like a lot of the Bronze Age cabinets and all of them are much thicker than they were when they originally started. You may have missed it as uh, it flashed by the screen earlier in the video with it, but when you're gluing melamine together you need to use a special type of glue. So I've been using Rue glue for the last couple of years with it. Uh, it's specifically made for bonding melamine together with it. Um, I did try and use the Type Bond 2, and the Type Bond 2 just doesn't hold as well as the uh, as the rear glue does. So um, if you are going to be making cabinet out of melamine, uh, may want to consider investing in, in some, some glue for it. Uh, it's about $9 a container, so it's not too expensive with it. Um, Amazon's uh, probably your most expensive source to find it. Um, so what I wind up doing is I'll put glue on the back of the, of the board with it, clamp it down in place with it, um, and then I'll wind up putting my screws in, essentially. Um, the screws were pre-measured so that they don't go through. Um, so as I talked about earlier, you want to make sure your screws won't blow through the uh, material and your, your panel, and that uh, when you are doing this, that you have your clutch set correctly on your drill so that it won't push into your soft pine blocking as well. So this process is basically repeated as you go around the cabinet. The goal is basically to have enough screws in to hold everything in place and make sure everything will be secure when it's finally assembled. You have to remember that the glue is also very strong, and so you could probably assemble the cabinet just with glue if you wanted to, or just with screws, uh, but by using both you have a double strength essentially for the project. So now I'm just starting to wipe down some of the dust as we're getting ready to paint. Um, most of the time I'll usually wind up taping out the entire cabinet and just painting the edges uh, to make sure that I kind of get that good seal and protect the edges from absorb absorbing moisture from the air. Um, in this case, you basically went over the cabinet with some 150 grit uh, sandpaper with it, um, trying to rough up the melamine so that the um, Rust-Oleum spray paint will stick adequately uh, to the cabinet. 
So now we're going to start applying some paint. Um, the paint I'm using is just Rust-Oleum Satin with it. It's the same paint I use pretty much for everything. Um, I also use it when I'm spraying with HVLP as well. Um, works very well for me. The goal here is really just to get a coat down. Um, I'll be putting a second coat down and I'll wind up sanding between coats as well, um, at least for the areas that are touching on the melamine. Uh, and I just want to kind of get a good coat on everything else. Uh, while I'm at it, I'm also painting the blocking. It just kind of makes the cabinet look a little bit nicer as a whole as well. But as I said, really the ultimate goal here is to try and seal up the edges, um, try and uh, isolate the places for the cabinet to be able to absorb moisture through the air. And that basically sums up our uh, prep work for assembly. Uh, obviously this is repeated on the second side of the cabinet and we are basically ready to do our final assembly and start applying our side art. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in video number six, final assembly.